Well, good day, everybody. This is Joe Van Cleve, and welcome to another episode of the Typewriter Video Series. Hey, uh, I was called up last week by a friend, an acquaintance of mine. He said, hey, Joe, uh, are you going to be home uh, this afternoon? I have something I want to bring over to you. And he came over and brought me this. Yes, that's right. A big black plastic clamshell or whatever case. Now you might be able to tell from the profile of it that it might have something in it that might resemble a typewriter. And yes, you're correct, it does. Let's take a look at it, shall we? Uh, yes, that's right. It is an Olympia Reporter Electronic typewriter. So I looked on the typewriter database after I got this machine and I only saw one other example of the Olympia Reporter Electronic and that was a sample that was submitted by Ui, uh, who is the gentleman who runs the uh, a typewriter discussion forum. I'll leave a link below. But he lives in Toronto. He uh, submitted his machine which is essentially identical to this one and he, I believe if I'm recalling now, I think he said the uh, the age on his was 1984 or 86, something in the mid 80s. There is no, that I could see unless I missed it, there is no real database of serial numbers that I can find for these machines. These are branded Olympia but they're made by Nakajima in Japan. So they're Japanese made um, uh, daisy wheel style electronic typewriters. I'm pretty impressed with the quality of it overall uh, actually and I'm going to make some comparisons between this typewriter and let's say the IBM Selectric 1 that I also have in my collection. But suffice it to say that I don't know the exact year of manufacture, but I would say it's the mid-1980s. So think, uh, in the United States, think the Reagan administration, the, the depths of the Cold War. Think of all the stories this typewriter could have typed on a national basis, but also in New Mexico as well. I don't think this machine is old enough to have been around in 1980 uh, when the prison riot in New Mexico happened, but uh, I think it was a little bit after that. So, But there were probably a lot of notable stories that were uh, typed on this machine. Well, let's get to it, shall we? First of all, when I got it out, there was no instruction manual or anything, and so I had to go on the internet to figure things out a little bit based on other Nakajima machines uh, similar to this one. But more notably is the power connector there. Uh, I didn't have a power cord that came with it. However, I do have a power cord that comes with these little $20 as seen on TV Bell and Hal brand LED lights that you buy at, I bought at Walgreens. And it has that little figure eight shaped, I guess you'd call it, uh, connector, power connector, which happens to be the same power connector as the Nakajima Olympia. So it plugs right in and yes, turns right on. So I'm going to lift up this little cover and pop it off there. This is a classic daisy wheel style electronic typewriter from the 1980s. It uses a carbon film ribbon cartridge that is reminiscent. It may be the exact same kind as the IBM Selectric 2 and 3 cartridge. It looks very similar. Also has a correction tape that looks remarkably similar to the IBM also. It may be the same or similar and I'm not enough of an expert yet to know. So when I first got this machine I plugged it in with this power cord off my LED light and I tried typing with it and virtually none of the keys would work. There was no typing. The, the uh, space bar would move the uh, print head mechanism back and forth. It was just not responding like it wasn't typing at all. Unless I pressed really hard on some of the keys and it would type. And so the first thing I thought of was, you know, the keyboard is probably an issue there. So I proceeded to take the shell apart. There's two screws underneath you loosen up and then you have to pry off the little plastic clips and split the two body halves apart. There's a seam in the middle there and you, you can pop off the top. By the way, there's only one platen knob on this machine. There's no right hand platen knob. It wasn't built with one, but you can pop off the left hand platen knob, the outer part of it and help you gain access to pull the shell off and around the shaft there. And then you get the top half off. 
unscrew some fasteners, some screws, take off the whole keyboard, disconnect some Japanese style connectors and a ribbon cable. You can take the entire keyboard out, which is what I did, and then I proceeded to, to unscrew the circuit board from the keyboard itself, and then I took out some of those fine little screws that kept the, the uh, keyboard together, and I tried squirting some alcohol into the keyboard with the idea that there was some kind of dust or grunge or gunk that had gotten into the keyboard over the years. Uh, when I did that and I put it back together, of course the keyboard didn't work at all now, and I realized that I had probably flooded the, the keyboard with alcohol and it wasn't dry, so I had to, I had to fully disassemble the keyboard, including removing the spring-loaded keys off the keyboard, and I ca it came down to a circuit board, pardon me, with a plastic film overlay and the alcohol had gotten in between the circuit board and the plastic film overlay and so I had to carefully peel this really thin film off and the back side of this plastic film had copper foil traces printed on it so it was extremely delicate you don't want to rip it and it did rip in several places but not anywhere where there was a circuit pattern so I was able to separate this plastic film from the actual substrate that has the copper uh, foil traces for the actual key, key imprints. I'm hitting my microphone. So then I was able to dry it out with a hair dryer, reassemble it, and after I put it back together, the keyboard worked. All the keys worked, which really surprised me because I really thought this was going to be a dead machine for sure. But after having uh, serviced <laughs> the um, keyboard and cleaned off the membrane and all that and put it back together, I had a couple other problems. Uh, one problem was that this correction ribbon here would, as you were typing, it would intermittently kind of lift up, want to partly lift up as you're typing, which I thought was really strange. And then the other problem was as you're typing, the print wheel would want to intermittently reset itself back to its home position in the middle of typing. And uh, that frustrated me for several days until I... So I decided to apply what is termed model-based problem solving to figure out what was happening here. And model-based problem solving is you... Okay, here is a close-up of the printhead mechanism. Now, back here is the rod that this whole printhead drives uh, laterally left and right on, and it's driven by a wire cable that runs around two pulleys from a, another motor. But uh, first of all, to remove the cartridge, let's pull this lever back. We lift up on it, and there is the print cartridge, the ribbon film cartridge. Put that aside. And then to look at the uh, print wheel itself, you pull this lever back, and this is the print wheel. And to eject the print wheel, you pull it back again, and it pops off the print wheel. This particular print wheel is a modern 12. So it is a 12 character per inch type typeface. You might notice here that the print wheel has the central hole in it that it mounts to the shaft of the spindle and then there is this little open notch at the top where my finger is here there is a little pin down here then when you put the print wheel back on the shaft of the spindle there's a little pin that protrudes and you have to line that hole up with a pin for it to go in there and that is the home position that determines the home position for the print wheel the home position for the print wheel is with this shorter pedal of the daisy wheel is the period symbol and that has to be straight up so the, the whenever you type a period you're actually typing the uh, home position <laughs> character for that machine so I put the wheel back in here and then I can fold it back into place so the way this works is this motor here runs the print wheel. It, it spins the print wheel. And of course, it, it turns the spindle on the front side to operate the wheel. But the back of the motor has a shaft that comes out of it here. And on that shaft is a flag. That flag right there goes into an optical interrupter, a little optical sensor. And when that flag hits the optical sensor, that's the home position. So that's how it knows what home position is, is the flag in the optical sensor. But as the 
the typewriter is typing the various letters and that wheel is turning back and forth in all those different angles to get each character, it has to keep track of the position of the motor. And so this stepper motor that runs the print wheel has feedback. It has a, a shaft encoder of some kind, feedback pulses that go back to the, to the control board. Actually, the control board is underneath here. And that tells the control board the position of the motor at any one time. And so my working physical model of the first problem this had, which is it would intermittently reset itself as you're typing. My model is that the encoder pulses, it, it's not getting the encoder pulses or intermittently losing them. And when it loses the encoder pulses, it re reverts to going back to the home position where this flag is to reset itself. And so to fix that problem, I took some control cleaner, some contact, electrical contact cleaner, and I sprayed it up into the shaft of this motor very thoroughly, and then operated the typewriter, hitting all the different keys and spinning that motor on all the different angles repeatedly, and I, I was able to, I'm hoping, get rid of that problem. I think the problem has not shown up again. So that was the first problem dealing with the, the encoder pulses coming off this uh, this motor for the print wheel. The second problem is related to intermittently lifting up the erasing ribbon as you're typing, kind of glitching out. There's a second motor down here that drives both the, the print cartridge when it prints the type on the cartridge. It prints it in two rows. There's two rows of type. And so as you're typing letters, what happens is, is this bracket goes up and down. One letter it's down, the next letter is up, the next letter is down, the next letter is up. And that's driven off this other motor. It has a cam on it that's physically moving the, the, uh, these guides up and down to make that alternating print position. And if you turn that motor even further, the cam will operate the lift mechanism for the erasing uh, ribbon. And so what's happening, I think, is the similar problem with that motor is the shaft encoder. There's a position sensor. It has a home flag, as the other one does, but there's also a shaft encoder that keeps track of where it's at. And it was losing those positions, and so intermittently it would glitch out and lose the position, and it would kind of raise it up like that. So I also tried to thoroughly flush out that motor with some control cleaner or contact cleaner. There's no right-hand platen knob, and so the way this typewriter is designed to be worked is this dust cover flips up, and you have a paper guide that's ratcheted here. You set it to a certain position, and then you set the paper against that guide and spin the knob and feed the paper in. Now I'm using this machine without uh, any cartridge in it right now. Let me turn it on here. Okay, so with that in place, um, you can type on this machine all day long like that at a regular a regular even pace and this print wheel will should operate normally but it's designed i believe to when you pause after about two seconds the print wheel resets itself back to the home position which is the period symbol so i can sit here all day long and the print wheel should keep track of its position but when you pause that little reset, it resets itself. When you come to a period, of course, a period in a sentence, that is a reset. So you could hit period all day long and it's, it's resetting itself to their home position. So the correction system should not lift itself up until you've hit a correction thing like that. And by the way, my correction tape is broken. It's, it's done, so I need to replace it as well. Okay, so let's put this cartridge back in. So to put it back in, the little rewinding knob on the left spool should be up. This red lever should be pushed in the direction of the arrow toward the rear of the machine. You want to engage the ribbon against these two guides that are raised up. You want to put them behind it and then pull it back and seat the cartridge in its home position like that and then pull this red lever back towards you. That lowers those two guides down and now the ribbon should be secured on there and turning the machine back on. 
we should be able to type now and get good imprints. So let's talk about some features on this machine. If you start on the left side of the platen, there are three different scales here, and these are and kind of tells you where you're at on the paper. Then, of course, you have your platen knob on the left side. And then down here on the front, um, you have this removable panel that you would gain access to your ribbons. Uh, and this panel has some manually set guides that you can use to indicate where you have your margins at. The margins are actually set electronically on the keyboard, but these are like indication guides for you to tell where your margins are. And there is a lit indicator, a uh, green lit indicator that you can see through the window of the scale here that tells you the position of the print position at any one time. So there is a paper bale that's operated by a lever here, and it has three rollers, and these are plastic rollers. There's no metal on them. I notice on this machine, when I'm threading the paper up, it doesn't want to go underneath these rollers. So you definitely have to kind of pop the uh, paper guide forward and then reset it back after the paper's passed it. So it doesn't have that nice smoothness, smoothness like some of the more sophisticated manual typewriters offered for loading the paper. Uh, this lever on the back right corner is to relieve pressure on the paper for you can readjust the position of it, so that's the pressure rollers. The dust cover that lowers down, as I indicated earlier, also has this uh, paper guide that ratchets back and forth. You can set the position of the left edge of the paper so when you feed the paper in, it'll guide itself through. Left side of the keyboard, you have a margin release button here that let, enables you to type beyond the left or right margins. And there is a keyboard 2 button which gives you alternate symbols. I'll give you an example is the number 1 key. Uh, the lower case of that is 1. If you shift it, it's an exclamation mark. But if you use the keyboard 2 button, it's going to be the vertical line. Similarly, with the number 2 key, lower case is 2, shifted is a the at symbol and the keyboard 2 symbol is going to be a squared, a superscript small 2. So you get all these alternative symbols up here based on whatever print wheel you're using of course. So that's the keyboard 2 switch. These are three uh, sliding switches. Uh, this top one, the three different size circles, is basically the heaviness of imprint which basically tells you how hard this little plunger hits the, the uh, print wheels. The middle switch is characters per inch, 10, 12, or 15. Since this is a 12 print wheel, I have it on 12. Um, but you can also do things like run it at 10. If you want to spread them apart more, you could run it at 15 and kind of crowd them together if you want. And the third switch is the line spacing 1, 1.5, and, and 2. For the keyboard itself, the main part of the keyboard, you have your standard keys here um, and space bar. The space bar will repeat itself if you hold it down. Then there is a repeat button. Uh, whatever the last character was that you printed, let's say an S, if you then hit the repeat key, it'll type repetitive S's. Or if you hit the H and then hit the repeat, it'll type repetitive H's or whatever. It, it'll also do repetitive spaces or even repetitive backspaces like that, which that's a good way to drive the print head back to the front of the line if you don't want to do an actual carriage return. Uh, there is a caps lock and you release it by hitting the shift button again, either shift button. And of course the carriage return. The carriage return button uh, is pretty big and it also has a lower part down here that you can also hit just to the right of the uh, quote mark and also if you don't want to reach all the way over with your pinky. Uh, this button up here operates the uh, correction tape, so whatever the last character, the previous character you typed, if you hit that, it'll go back one space and operate the correction tape for you. So there is a tab key right here on the left side above the shift lock, and your tabs are set over here on the right side with tab set and tab clear. And then you have your margin, left and right margin set buttons uh, over here as well, for you can set your margins. And that's pretty much it for all the controls on this typewriter. So it is a daisy wheel electronic typewriter. It has essentially a one character correction. It remembers the last character that you printed and you can correct that. It doesn't have a bigger memory. It also does not have the uh, control code. So there is a lot of these more modern 
more advanced um, daisy wheel electronic typewriters had a code button and if you hold the code button down or press it and then type some letter or number combination it would give you other advanced features in the machine. Well this doesn't have a code button, it doesn't have that feature, so it's more of just a basic typewriter. Well, a few final thoughts on this typewriter. Again, it was a typewriter that I did not expect to uh, be getting. It was a surprise. It does take up a bigger footprint on the desk than an IBM Selectric 1, but it's not as tall. It is lighter, of course. This is electronic. It's a combination of electromechanical and an electronic keyboard circuit board. Whereas the IBM Selectrics were strictly electromechanical, the IBM Selectrics were really a lot more complicated mechanically than the daisy wheel typewriters. And philosophically, if you had to start over, let's say theoretically, or design an electronic or electrical typewriter from scratch, probably the daisy wheel design is a more elegant solution to the problem because it just simplifies it. You have a motor that spins a print wheel, another motor that lifts your ribbon and does your correction, and then a third motor that runs the, uh, the print mechanism along the carriage. Whereas the IBM is a lot more complicated with that golf ball design that articulates and everything. As far as uh, the, this particular typewriter, its response is quite quick and swift. It may not be quite as responsive as the IBM Selectric, and the keyboard, although it's pretty good, is not quite as good. It's a little bit less quality than the IBM Selectric keyboard, but it's really pretty quick still. I can touch type on this machine pretty darn fast. I think the typewriter does not slow me down at all. I think the limitation is my own skill. Having said that, I have tried later uh, daisy wheel typewriters and the one the later ones where they put in more features like auto correction memory where as soon as you type a wrong word it beeps at you those kind of things well it's buffering your entire keyboard through a memory and a processor that's comparing every word against some internal library and all that stuff takes processing time and slows down the response of the keyboard of to printing between the time it takes to press the letter and where you get a printed character on paper. So my gut feel is that the less features it has, the more responsive it is. <laughs> at least the ones that I've tried. And this um, Nakajima from the mid-80s seems to be pretty well made in terms of response and it's, it is a really usable typewriter. Not quite as nice of a touch as an IBM Selectric, but it is uh, certainly at the time it was made, this was a lot less expensive to buy. And uh, I think my gut feel is these were probably more reliable than an IBM Selectric. And I only say that because there's no evidence that this machine was ever serviced. It has been in probably continuous use from the mid-1980s up until whenever the computers displaced them. There's no indication of any servicing on this, any sticker, and it was as dirty as it was and the problems that it did have, it certainly appeared to me like it had never been serviced, uh, which is a pretty a strong testimony to its reliability, I think. But I know on the other hand, that there are a number of typewriter repair shops around the country who make a good business in keeping IBM Selectrics in service because if they're heavily used, they do need to be serviced because they're so complicated electromechanically. So, uh, yeah, this uh, Daisy Wheel typewriter, if I had that last remaining problem to fix out of this, I would be really happy to call this a new member of my typewriter family, my typewriter collection. Um, I've left the machine on, powered on, since I've been doing my edit and shooting more scenes. And I just tested it out here a while ago before I shot this clip, and it didn't do any of the problems. So it's, it is likely that it's a thermal problem. When you first turn it on and it's cold, otherwise, when it, once it heats up, it seems to be uh, working fine, which probably indicates just leave the typewriter plugged in and turned on, maybe. Oh yeah. There is no motor turning all the time. With an IBM Selectric, as soon as you turn it on, there's a motor continuously turning. No, this thing is turned on right now. It's turned on right now. It only uh, operates a motor when you press the key. 
Uh, it do, of course, it has circuitry in the keyboard circuit that's waiting for you to press a key, looking for that pulse. But uh, it doesn't draw nearly the power when it's idle as a, a Selectric would. Well, as always, if you guys have any comments or questions, leave them down below. And also, by the way, this being the last Sunday in July of 2018, I will be uh, doing the uh, typing assignments number 18 video, probably be putting it up tomorrow. So get those last minute assignments in if you can. And until next time, as always, you guys have yourselves a great day.